Yeah, hear me at the back? Brilliant. Okay, we'll get started then, because I know you're all waiting for lunch. I certainly am. Um, welcome to my talk. My name is Mark West, and I'm going to tell you today about how I smartened up a simple web camera by wiring it up to the cloud. And before I start, a little bit about who I am, because I've never been to Geek on Prague before. So, as you can probably hear, I'm an Englishman, but I actually live in Oslo, Norway, where I work at a company called Buvet, which is actually a Norwegian company. It sounds like a French company, but it's actually Norwegian. And in my spare time, I like hacking stuff. You know, I like messing around with hardware and software and just generally having a good time with it. I work with Java. I'm trying to learn JavaScript. And uh, mainly, I work with AI, the cloud, and the Internet of Things in my day-to-day -day life. And in the spare time I have left, I'm an active member of the Norwegian Java user group called Java Bin. And we organize a little conference called Java Zone. And if any of you are ever in Oslo in September, you should come to Java Zone because it's a great conference. All right, let's get on with the talk. I've split the talk up into five sections to make it easy to follow. And I'm going to start by talking about why I built this camera and the requirements I set for myself before going on to explaining how I put together a motion activated camera. I'll then explain how I smartened up the camera by adding the power of the cloud to it before evaluating the project and giving you some tips for replicating my own project when you get home. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about Node versus Java-based Amazon Lambda functions. Now, I'm not talking about Java Lambda functions here. I'm talking about AWS Lambda functions, which are basically serverless functions. Right, so why did I build this thing? Well, you can see here it says input from stakeholder. And this was actually a hobby project. And like any project, it has a start and an end and a stakeholder and a project manager. The stakeholder and the project manager were the same person. They were my wife. And um, the reason we built this camera was because there had been loads of break-ins around us. All the houses around us had been broken into. We were the only ones that hadn't been burgled. So we were like, OK, we need to have some kind of early warning system. We have already a security system in our house, but we don't have an early warning system for saying, oh, there's somebody in our garden. We only know, with the existing system, we only know that someone's breaking in when they're actually already in the house. So we wanted an early warning system. So we drew up some project requirements. And uh, on the functional side, yeah, we want to monitor activity in our garden. We want to send a warning when activity is detected. And we want a live video stream. So basically, we just want a webcam, simple stuff. Then my wife got involved and came with the non-functional requirements. Get it done quickly. <laughs> Get it done cheaply. But the last one, make it portable so you can move it around. So after these requirements, I put together a very simple functional design. We need a web camera that monitors the garden. When it detects motion, it sends us an email. It's a trivial project, right? It's a trivial Raspberry Pi project. So to build the first version of the camera, I needed some hardware. And I wanted to base the camera on one of these, a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. It's a tiny little Linux PC. You've all heard of Raspberry Pis, right? Yeah, yeah. This is like the, the little brother, right? The, the, the tiniest Raspberry Pi. And this is actually a Raspberry Pi Zero W, which has wireless built in. So you don't have to worry about connecting a wireless dongle to that. And those cost about 90, no, <laughs> 90, 9 euro for a Raspberry Pi Zero with uh, wireless. But like you need an SD card, you need a power pack, you, know, you need adapters and whatnot. So I bought one of these, which is a, an essentials kit, which has all the parts that I need for my project, apart from the camera. And um, the good thing about this is you can reuse all these parts for other projects later on. I also decided I wanted to use a Raspberry Pi camera module, which is one of these. And they come in two flavors. They come in the standard, you know, the standard uh, camera module. But also, it comes in a, a, a version called the Noir. And Noir means no infrared. So basically, if you use a Noir camera and you pair it up with an infrared light source, you get night vision. But I decided just to go with a standard camera to start with. I also needed a camera adapter to plug the, uh, the camera into the Raspberry Pi Zero's little camera port. And I needed something to mount it on the window. So I invested in one of these. It's a Zero View. You see it in the corner there. And basically, it's a bit of plastic with two suckers on the front. And you, you, you screw everything to that, and then you stick it to the inside of your window, which means you don't have to weatherproof the camera, and it's, you, know, you can just plug the camera into, your, into the uh, power supply in your living room. So total cost of the hardware, 73 euro. This is what the camera looks like, uh, close up. 
So you see the back view, you can actually see the SD card hanging out there. The cable attached to it is the power, and you see the front view with the two suckers. I should just mention that I'm going to be putting all my slides out on SlideShare at the end of the talk. So if you just look for the Geekong hashtag and uh, my, uh, my handle, my Twitter handle, then you'll be able to look at my slides without having to take pictures of them or anything like that. So OK, we have the hardware. What about the software? Well, as you remember, my wife, my project manager, and my stakeholder, and my soulmate, um, she wanted this done quickly. So I, instead of writing it myself, I just used something called Motion. Anybody heard of Motion? Yeah, maybe a couple of people. Right. So Motion is open source motion detection software. And it's basically you know, Linux-based, has great performance in the Raspberry Pi Zero, and it has a built-in web server. So it gives me that as well. And how Motion works, it just monitors your video stream. And when it detects motion, it triggers an event. And you can wire up events up to anything you want to. So in my case, I wired the event up to a bash script. And the bash scripts, it just uh, takes a snapshot from the video stream and sends me it in an email. The good thing about Motion works out the box. It's just configuration. So I was able to get up and running really quickly. So I'm just going to show you the Motion web servers running now. I've got two cameras on the stage with me. One is a standard Raspberry Pi, and the other one is a Pi Noir. Uh, if I just like, so you see they're both pointing at the Geekon sign. Just refresh them there. So the one on your, you can't really see them so good on this screen, but the one on your left-hand side is the standard camera, and the one on your right-hand side is the, is the, night, or the Noir camera. And you can see the Noir camera is a little bit greenish, when it looks at that white sign there, it comes with a kind of greenish tinge. But anyway, this is the streaming video. You can actually see, if I actually zoom into one of these so you can see it maybe a bit better, you can actually see like, oh yeah, it's not a very good vision, picture up here, but it looks pretty good on my PC anyway. Um, in the bottom corner here, you have like an individual identifier for the camera. You have a, also a date and time stamp. And the top right-hand corner, there's a little line, a little dash. And like the camera's deactivated now, but when it's activated, that dash changes uh, to a number, and it tells you how many pixels change from frame to frame. So that's motion in a nutshell. It's very, very simple, nothing too complicated. Right, so with that, um, with motion running on the camera and the camera put together, I had like a, a, you know, a motion detected camera, motion detection camera ready to run. Uh, how motion works just really, really quickly, as I mentioned before, it's comparing each frame from your video stream to the previous frame. And if the frames are exactly the same, no problem, right? But like, um, if something changes in the frame, like in this case, a, a thief has come into my garden, that would raise an event. I would get an email with that snapshot number three. And these are some real snapshots from the camera. Uh, the reason that's to get it running quickly is because we were going on holiday for four weeks. Uh, so the camera was running for four weeks without anybody being there, just running 24-7. And um, it was a hot summer, so we asked our neighbors to water the plants. So we actually got a warning every time they watered the plants, which was good. And um, the last picture, but you can't, I don't know how well you can make that out, that's me coming home from holiday and walking around the back garden to see if the camera was still working. So it worked really, really well. And if we evaluate the project requirements, we monitor activity in the garden, we get a warning when activity is detected. We have a live video stream. It was in place. It took me seven hours to put it together. F 15 minutes to put the hardware together, and the rest of the time was you know, flashing, a Raspberry, sorry, flashing an SD card with Raspbian, installing Motion, configuring it, trying, failing, you know, doing a couple of rounds with that, and then finally writing a bash script to send me an email. So it took me seven hours to put together. Low cost, 73 euro, and I can reuse the parts for other projects. And it's portable. So we were happy. Me and my wife were really, really happy. And like, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Actually, it wasn't that good. The problem was these, the false alarms. right? We have a lot of cats in our neighborhood. And um, the little things like to go into our garden to do all kinds of stuff. And um, every time the cats walked across our garden, I got an email. Every time a cloud moved across the sky, email. Um, every time shadows moved across the patio, email. Every time it rained and rain dripped down the window in front of the, uh, in front of the camera lens, email. So I was, I was kind of like constantly being bombarded with emails, up to 250 emails a day. <laughs> and you can imagine, you stop paying attention to the camera, you know, because it's just like noise, right? So you start just deleting all the emails without reading them. So the camera loses its effectiveness. And the problem is motion. Motion is great, but it only cares about the amount of pixels changing from frame to frame. It doesn't care about why they're changing. It doesn't care about the context. 
So I needed to find a solution. And what I wanted was like basically some kind of filter that would say, cat, no, person, yes. So which would filter out all of the false alarms. And as I mentioned before, this was a real project with a real project manager. My wife actually works in change management. Um, so I had to kind of raise a change request. So this is true. <laughs> Over dinner one night, I said to her, we should change one of the requirements from send warning when activity is detected to send warning when human activity detected. And um, you know, I was able to um, get her at the right time. She had a glass of wine. And I managed to convince her that I could probably fix this quite quickly if she allowed me to. And she said, how long will it take? And I said, oh, uh, three days. And she was like, OK, three days. You've got three days. <sighs> uh, OK. So I did a heck of a lot of Googling and a lot of panicking. And I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, but I decided, nonetheless, to try something new. And um, I landed, in the end, on Amazon recognition as a solution to my problem. Now, AWS stands for Amazon Web Services. And recognition is one of the Amazon Web Services that like, you've all probably heard of. And what it does, it gives you image analysis as a service. So again, no coding, just like, you know, send in information, get out information. And it has a range of APIs from face detection and sentiment analysis to uh, object detection. And it's built upon deep neural networks, launched last November, so it's relatively new. There's alternatives here. I am not an Amazon evangelist. It's very, very important, right? And you, can do, you can solve the same problem with other uh, solutions, such as Google Vision, Microsoft Cognitive Services, Clarify, all of these things give you the similar kind of functionality that I used. I'm just going to give you a quick demo of recognition just to show you how I used it. So if I just go to my web browser, let me see if we go to the AWS console. So I'm going to log into the Amazon Web Service Console, and that gives me access to all the different services they have. So if you just bear with me a moment while it logs in. Is it actually doing anything? Yeah, it's running through the world's slowest internet. Let me see. Just wait for that to run. Of course, we're in the cinema. You know, They don't want to have good Wi-Fi in the cinema, do they? They don't want people surfing the internet when the film's on. So uh, that's why it's a bit slow today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually upload a picture to the recognition, the standard recognition demo page, and that will actually show you how I've thought about using it. So here we go. Right, so if I try a demo here and then upload my own picture. So I'm going to upload the picture that I showed you earlier on, the picture of the burglar in my garden. See what recognition makes of this. So what it's done is come up with like some labels which it thinks describes a picture with confidence scores. So you see here that this isn't intelligence. You know, it's not very sure what's going on. And you know, it's not sure what's going on, and it thinks it might be art. This picture of a burglar might be art. It might be modern art. But it does actually think that like, there's a good chance it might be a person, which is quite useful. The last thing it thinks, this might be a selfie. Does anybody want to guess why Amazon Recognition thinks this picture is a selfie? Anybody? <laughs> selfie stick, exactly. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't that brilliant? But now you see how I'm thinking about using recognition. I can just use it as a filter. So let me just get my presentation back up, and we'll continue. Right. So I wanted to add Amazon Web Services or recognition to my camera. And like my camera initially was just sending emails, right? And I thought, OK, how can I get my camera to talk to recognition? Should I do a synchronous call, asynchronous call? How should I do it? In the end, I, I decided what I, instead what I would do is I would just basically delegate the whole processing of the picture to the Amazon Cloud. This would just me, it would make sure that my camera could just focus on being a camera and not have to worry about other things. So what I was going to do instead, I was going to get my camera to upload the picture to Amazon. The snapshot would be analyzed using recognition, the service I just showed you. And then if it was found to contain a person, then I would get the email. And this is how it looks. I'm just going to step through the processing so you can see how I used the different Amazon Web Services. So the first thing that happens is the picture is uploaded from the camera. And it's uploaded to something called S3, Simple Storage Service. And uh, that's basically like Dropbox. And when the picture is uploaded, it activates a trigger. The trigger, in turn, activates a workflow, which is an Amazon Web Service step function. That workflow orchestrates a set of uh, steps. And the first thing it does, it calls Amazon Recognition to analyze the picture. And finally, if the picture contains a person, it calls the simple email service to send me the email. Bang. 
And like, because of all these components, they're, li they're lying out on the internet, they're distributed. You need some kind of security between them. And like, for that, we use uh, Amazon Web Service Identity Access Management to give us role-based security. I'm also using Amazon Web Service Lambda functions. These are serverless functions, and I use them to implement the upload trigger and quite a few of the steps in my step function. So Lambda functions, for those of you who haven't uh, heard of them, they're basically small units of code. And we're talking about Amazon Lambda functions here, not Java Lambda functions, just uh, to clear that up. So you can write Amazon Lambda functions in Java, C Sharp, Python, or even Node, and they're serverless. So you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. You write your code, you upload it. You don't have to worry about uptime, you don't have to worry about like load balancing, failover, scaling, anything like that. The infrastructure takes care of it. They're highly available, of course. They're cloud-based services. And they have a pay-as-you-go model, so you pay for what you use. So each time you call a Lambda function, you pay a fixed fee. But you also pay a variable cost based on how much memory you use and how long the function takes to run. And finally, using Lambda functions gives you access to the Amazon Web Service SDK, so you can use them as your glue between your Amazon Web Services. Now, demo, I'm not going to show you a demo, but I'm going to show you a Java Lambda function, how it looks. So if I just switch over to Eclipse now, you can read that, can't you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, I'm, just, I'm going to zoom in, but I just want to, that's one Lambda function. And this Lambda function actually takes the image that's come in and sends it to recognition, takes the output and outputs them in a, um, in a properties, no, in a, um, yeah, a parameters uh, Java file. Let me just zoom in so we can see it a bit close, more closely. Can you read that now? Yeah. It's mostly comments, but what's happening is we're actually, I'll close that there, we are implementing a request handler, and the request handler takes a parameters object in and returns a parameters object. Now, you can actually set any object here, but I've created my own POJO, which is here, which is just a, a list of, if I can click on it, which is just a list of uh, yeah, properties and getters and setters. So basically, the, what happens here is like we, we start by calling this handle request method, passing the parameters here, and also a context object. The context object comes from the Amazon infrastructure and gives us a handle on all kinds of things. For example, logger. So we can use the context object to get hold of a logger, and the first thing we do here is we just log the parameters. We then create a recognition client. We create a simple recognition request, which is basically a reference to an S3 object. And then we call the service. Oops. Sorry, we call the service. And the final thing we do is we just take the results and put them back in the parameters and log it and return it. That's it. This is trivial stuff. But if we go and have a look at the uh, website, because like basically what we do is we, we take that Java code and we upload it to the Amazon Lambda infrastructure. So I'm just going to show you that. Again, running on the world's slowest internet. Let's see where we're going now. So we go into the Lambda function console here, and here I'll have a list of all the Lambda functions that I've created. And I can select one of them, and I can do all kinds of stuff with it. I can, I can mess around with the amount of memory that's available to the Lambda function. I can set the timeout for the Lambda function. Uh, Lambda functions have a maximum timeout of five minutes, so they're not made for long-running long processes. Um, also, you can test the Lambda functions. And it seems to me that like, the Internet has just decided to give up on me. I'm just going to change to a different a different uh, Wi-Fi, and see if that helps. But yes, anyway, so like from, from this uh, console, you can do anything with your Lambda function. You can test them, you can configure them, and whatnot. Let me just try and run that again, just to see if it comes up quicker this time. Here we go. OK, so here's all the Lambda functions. So you can actually filter them on the runtime. In this case, I'm going to filter them out by Java 8. The Lambda function that I just showed you is this one here. So we'll click on him, open him up. And as I mentioned before, you can you can Trigger, you can tweak the amount of memory available here all the way down to 128 and up to 1536. I'll just put it back where it was. And you have like the timeout here, which is like set to the maximum five minutes. Just to show you a very, very quick test, I'm actually going to show you a test which, which is going to fail because I think that's actually quite interesting to see. So if I configure the test and configure it so it will fail, yes, it will fail now. If I run the test, I just want to show you, like, you know, how you can test the Lambda functions in the console. Here we go. And here's the exception. Basically, I passed in an image file that doesn't exist, so I got a, an error back saying, basically, invalid S3 object exception. And uh, Lambda functions, uh, all of the logs are logged in something called CloudWatch, which is a bit like Splunk. 
So you can go into CloudWatch and do all kinds of things. You can create dashboards. Uh, you can create like uh, graphs, and yeah, you can search your logs for um, specific, specific uh, instant, um, specific uh, for errors, and all kinds of stuff. All right, back to the presentation. And while I'm doing that, actually, I'll just change back to my the the, the other wireless that I was using because I'm going to be doing a demo in just a second, and I need to be on that wireless. Right, okay. So, lambda functions, I've talked about them now. Now I'm going to talk about step functions. So, step functions are basically, they're there to orchestrate your lambda functions into workflows or into state machines. That's what they do. And they're relatively new as well, launched in December last year. And um, basically what you do is you define your step functions using JSON files. So, you create a JSON file with a set of states, and then you basically define the transitions bet between those states. And when you've uploaded your JSON file to, uh, to Amazon's infrastructure, you get a very nice visual representation of your, your step function. And step functions provide all the same benefits as lambda functions. They're scalable, pay-as-you-go, serverless, and whatnot. So this is what a step function looks like when it's, once it's been uploaded to the infrastructure. This is one of the visit visualizations that's created. And I'm just going to go through this and explain what's going on. So the image is uploaded to S3, which triggers this step function. So the first thing that happens is we have a call to the lambda function I just showed you. The Lambda function actually evaluates the image and gives you labels back. The next step is a call to another Lambda function, which compares the labels that I got from step one to a blacklist and tries to find out if we have an alert situation or not. Step three is just a decision point in the step function. There's no Lambda function called here. All that happens is we look at the results of step two and say, OK, is a send alert set to true or false? If send alert is set to true, we call another Lambda function, which then sends us an email using the AWS simple email service. And finally, we have a cleanup Lambda function that archives the image in the right place. We have two archives, one for real alerts and one for false alarms. And we also, of course, we have an error handler. For any unchecked exception that's thrown of the, by these other Java Lambda functions, they will be thrown out to step six here, which is an error handler, which will log the error and send me an email saying something's gone wrong. OK, now we're going to try and do a demo. So I'm going to try and show you step functions and the cameras working. So as I mentioned before, we are running on a bit of a slow internet, so hopefully, hopefully everything will go well. I'm just going to set up the screen so you can see what's going on. Just zoom it back in there. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and trigger my two, step, uh, my two uh, cameras by walking in front of them. And then what will happen, the image will be uploaded to, to S3, and uh, we will be able to go through the step functions processing of the pictures. But first, I just remembered I need to reactivate the cameras because they're both in pause mode. So start that one there. And this one here as well. Just start both cameras so they're actually detecting. Right. So... Both cameras should now be running. Now I'm going to try and step in front of them and see what happens. All right, OK. So we'll see how quick the, everything's working now. Oh, you can s just about see me. There I am. Hello, world. Finally on the big screen. Um, right. So what's happening now is the images are being uploaded. Now I've piped into my, to my Raspberry Pi here, so you can see the upload scripts running. And when those upload scripts are finished, you'll see that like, when they're both completed, then the images are up in S3. So what's happening now is that the image is being processed by S3. Uh, sorry, by the step function. So it'll be sent to recognition. If the uh, recognition finds a person, then I'll get an email saying there's a person in the camera. So here we go. Let's see if this is going to work. It's always fun with live demos, right? So I just have to, as I said, running on the slow internet. So hopefully we will get an email through. Let's see. Oh, it's taking its time. We'll just let him wait. In the meantime, I can show you, and, uh, when I was uh, sitting in the last talk, I was actually testing the camera. This is an example email, where you get like uh, <laughs> beard, <laughs> hair, that's kind of ironic, really. Um, person, yeah. So you see how it works. You get a snapshot on the labels. But it seems to me that like uh, maybe things aren't going my way today. Let's see, try one more time. Ah, oh, here they come. Right, so I've got two emails. The first email says people, person, human, classroom, speech. Face and selfie, there's a picture of me. And from the other camera, which is the noir camera, we've got people, person, human, class, and speech, head, portraits, face, yeah, goggles. <laughs> uh, 
And there I am again, a slightly greener version of me. So that's the camera working. Just for fun's sake, I just uh, want to show you how the step functions actually process that image. So I'm going to go to the step function console. I just need to copy that ID there because that will help me find the right step function execution. So if I go back to, let me see. Now I'm going completely blind. Here we go. Step functions, there we are. So just go back to that console. And I'll show you how the step function looked that was processed. So the good thing about the, the, the console for step functions, it gives you an overview of all the step functions you've created, and you can go and you can look at the, the instances and uh, actually like step through them to make sure that everything runs as it should have. I think I need to change back to the other uh, Wi-Fi again, so I'll just do that. It is actually, I, I, I've thought about it a lot the last couple of days, like, you know, that why, why you wouldn't have good Wi-Fi in a cinema. I mean, it is obvious, really, isn't it? Uh, it's not a really clever thing to have. But it's a bit annoying when, you, when you're relying on the internet for your presentation. <laughs> uh, it's still taking its time. Here we go. Here we go. Right. So if we drill into the step function that I want to look at, here we go. Open that up. So we'll see. Here is the actual executed step function. All the green steps are the ones that have been executed. So you can actually look at the input to each step. So the input to the first step was the actual reference to the image that had been uploaded. And that's this reference here. The next step generated all of the labels. And, uh, and no, so it evaluated all labels and uh, set the alert flag to true. OK, so just to explain that again, the image comes in, input here. And here's the image reference. The output from step one is all of these labels. The input to step two is all of the labels. And the output is the set alert flag set to true, which meant that like, the make alert decision then sends the email and archives the file. And the file would then be archived as a alert, which makes it, means it a real alarm. So if I just try something fun, I have to change back to the other Wi-Fi again. I'm going to try something. I'm going to try and activate the camera with some, something that isn't human. And uh, luckily, I have a uh, a testing device with me. So I just need to get those cameras to be working, and it is here. So I borrowed this from my daughter. So let's see if this works now. And now you're seeing the new remake of Godzilla. Rawr. Rawr. Uh, isn't it cute, actually? Right, take them away. And then what we'll do is we'll go back and look at our step functions again. So we'll just wait for those files to upload. Yep, completed. And I'll just change away from that Wi-Fi for once and for all now because I don't need it again. So if we then go back to our step function and look at the latest executions, those will be the executions where these files are being processed. Just close that as well. I'm not having any luck with the Wi-Fi today. So what we'll see in, in this, what we should see, is that like uh, a person wasn't detected in the picture, so the set alert flag was set to false, so the email wasn't sent. It's just to show that like the camera does actually work, that I don't get like emails when, I, when a dinosaur comes into my garden. Let's see if it's running. It doesn't seem to want to uh, play with me today, the internet. No. Oh, no. Now I'm just waiting for Amazon to catch up. But you see here, no other emails have come in. So I think that kind of proves things. Instead of waiting for this, we'll just go on with the talk, because I know you're all hungry and want to eat lunch. So we'll leave that as it is and go back to the presentation. Right. Right, so what did we learn from this project? Well, I mean, I learned quite a lot because I'd never used any of the Amazon services that I used in this project before. I'm going to be honest, that isn't a lie. I've never used S3, never used Lambda functions, any of it before. And the first version of the camera I wrote using Node.js, which made things a little bit quicker to get started with, just because uh, Node.js has, has less baggage when you're you know, doing like uh, quick and dirty coding. But um, it was a very interesting project. Uh, but if we look at the actual project itself, you know, we satisfied the requirements. You know, everything is done. I don't get anywhere near the amount of false alarms I get. I get maybe, 
On a bad day, I might get two or three false alarms. So it's cut down that problem drastically. And I more or less, yeah, 90% of the time I get an email when somebody comes into my garden. There's a lot of kids in the neighborhood that like to come in. So I always get an email when they come in. So I'm quite happy with that. This question comes up a lot. Yeah, it's a fun project, but have you actually caught any criminals? Well, yes. Last May, I got an email from a guy in California who had actually seen my blog post about this uh, camera, had implemented it, and the day after he implemented it, he actually sent me an email because someone was trying to break in. He called the police, they came and arrested the guy, and like, the emails from my camera were used, actually, as evidence in the end to, uh, to put him in jail. So that was pretty cool. Another thing, cost. Right? Amazon Web Services isn't free. You have to pay for it. So um, here's how much it costs for me to run the camera in August. That was uh, processing 8,093 pictures. It cost me 5 euros and 15 cents. Most of that cost was on recognition and on the step function side. Now what's interesting here is that I've not been using re uh, Amazon Web Services for a year yet. So I've only been using it for about 10 months. And the first year that you use Amazon Web Services, you get a special price, a special deals uh, for some of the services. And what will happen is next year I will go on the normal, the standard rates. And what that means, in effect, is that next year I will be paying, if for the same amount of images, I'll be paying around about 12 euros a month. So the cost goes up quite a bit. Most of that extra cost will be because of recognition. Today I get 5,000 free images per month. Uh, after Christmas, I would have to pay for those 5,000 images, and I think it's a dollar per thousand images. The other thing is interesting here is the Lambda functions I don't pay anything for. I don't use them in anywhere near enough to actually have to pay for them. Uh, on the memory allocation I'm using today, I get 1.6 million seconds a month of uh, free usage on, of Lambda functions, and I'm nowhere near that, that uh, threshold yet. One of the other things I learned in this project was like, the importance of uploading the right picture. So if you imagine like, you have, like, if you have like, 30 pictures of me walking across your garden, which picture is the one you should upload to recognition? Because, you know, the thing is, is like recognition is only as good as the pictures you upload. So if the picture of me walking across your garden, if, if you just take one picture where I'm behind a tree or where I'm in shadow, it may not be good enough for recognition to find a person. So this is the question, which picture should motion, which is running on my, on my webcam, upload? And the thing is, when motion detects activity, it sets up an event with a start and a stop and a timeline. And on that timeline, you've got all the pictures. Now you can actually tweak motion to make that timeline shorter or longer, up to, you know, but based on what you want to do. But the thing is, which of these pictures should you upload? Motion gives you some predefined, uh, yeah, predefined rules for uploading pictures. For example, you can upload the first picture. You can upload the picture with the most pixels changed. You can even upload the picture with the most central activity. Or alternatively, you can choose to upload all the snapshots. The question is, is you know, which is right? You know, I mean, if you upload, for example, the first picture, that might just be my foot coming into the frame. The picture with the most pixels changed might be me putting my hand over the camera. The picture with the most central activity might be me hiding behind a tree. So, and all the pictures, I mean, that's going to be just too much, right? Luckily, you can configure motion very much into what it uploads and what it doesn't upload. But like, you need to choose an image upload strategy, and it's going to be based on how much you want to pay. If you go for one snapshot per motion event, then it's going to cost you less, but your hit rate might be lower. If you choose to upload many pictures, it's going to cost you more, but your hit rate is going to be higher. OK. Right. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I actually originally created these Lambda functions the Lambda function part of my solution was, was uh, created using Node.js. Uh, it was just a, an easy way to get started because you can write Node.js Lambda functions directly in the browser. But after a while of running these Node.js functions, I wanted to see how they would run if I, if, if I converted them to Java. An interesting little experiment. Now, very, very important here, I don't want to kind of get into some kind of Java, JavaScript religious war. I, I believe that they're very different animals and they both have their uses. Uh, so in this uh, part of the talk, I'm focusing on the difference between Lambda sorry, Java and Node in the context of Amazon Lambda functions. That's very important. But when I actually um, ported my uh, Node.js 
functions to Java, I found three things to be of interest. One was the artifact sizes, one was the memory requirements, and finally, performance and cost. So I'm just going to share these lessons with you all. First and foremost, the Lambda functions that I focused on, which I ported over to Java, were these four here. And it was the Lambda function that sends the picture to recognition, the Lambda function that evaluates the labels, the Lambda function that sends the email, and finally the Lambda function that archives the image. The first thing I noticed was the artifact size are different. So these are the size of the Lambda functions according to the AWS dashboard. You can see here, Java is somewhat bigger than Node.js. Why is this? Well, there uh, are uh, three reasons that I came up with. One is that um, <laughs> Java is generally more verbose. That's just the way it is. The second problem was actually unused jars in the Java deployment. So what I was using was I was using the AWS plugin for Eclipse. So I was writing my Java Lambda functions or my Java AWS Lambda functions, right-clicking on them, deploying to the AWS infrastructure. And that deploy created a POM file, packaged everything up, and uploaded it. But of course, the POM file that was being created just took loads of extra baggage that I didn't need. So that had a lot to do with the uh, extra size of the Java artifacts. So if you're doing something like this, you'd want to amend your POM file, try and like, reduce the amount of rubbish that's been uploaded. Finally, the uh, final reason is that, like, as I mentioned before, you can write your Node.js Lambda functions directly in the browser. And therefore, the AWS SDK is natively available to Node.js Lambda functions. If you're creating Java-based AWS Lambda functions, then you have to package up all of your dependencies, including the AWS ones. So it just makes them bigger. Another difference I saw between Java and Node.js was memory requirements. How much memory do they need? Node.js was quite happy with 128 megabytes of memory. No problem. When I tried running my Java 8 Lambda functions or my Java 8 AWS Lambda functions, they required 256 megabytes. That's twice the amount. Does it make any difference? It does, because you pay based on how much memory you use. So you see in this table on, the, on, the, on your right-hand side of the screen, you pay double as much for 256 per second than you do for 128. And what's even more interesting is the amount of free seconds you get is half. So you only get 1.6 million seconds a month for free for 256 megabyte Lambda functions, whereas you get, get 3.2 million seconds a month free if you're using the lowest amount of memory. So I got to thinking, if I'm running you know, uh, Java and Node.js Lambda functions you know, in, under the same kind of like, uh, constraints, will Java run faster and therefore cost less money than Node? So I decided to do some testing. And the thing is, when you're testing, it's like benchmarking uh, serverless, you really need to be careful because like, that, it very much depends on your use case, right? The results you get are going to depend very much on your use case. And in my case, I just decided that I was going to just simulate my camera. And I would, that would be my testing. So I would just simulate just 1,500 alerts. That's, just, that's all. I would trigger them in batches of 30 with a 60-second pause because I wasn't load testing AWS Lambda, but I, wanted to, I, I wasn't interested in load testing it at all. I was interested in just seeing how it would behave if it was bombarded with pictures in the same way that my, my camera bombards AWS with uh, pictures. I set the memory to both, uh, to both the sets of Lambda functions to 256 to give them an even, play, even playing field. And prior to testing, I rested my Lambda functions, rested them for 90 minutes. So what that means is that when you don't call a Lambda function for nine minute, 90 minutes, or I think it's more than 50 minutes actually, what happens is all the Lambda functions in memory, all the instances in memory, get shut down. So by resting them, for 90 minutes, I was giving both sets of Lambda functions an even uh, playing field on the same start point. I also ran my test five times, uh, different times of the day, just to see if they would be consistent, and they were very consistent. And here's the results. So like for like, you can see here that like, uh, <laughs> Java was using quite a lot more time than Node.js, and that, over time, means that Java, in my use case, would cost more money. It's not necessarily relevant for all use cases, but for my use case, if I was running, like, say, 10 million 
images through this uh, infrastructure every month. Then I would be paying considerably more if I was using Java than Node.js. So why was Java slower? Well, the main reason is the cold starts. So what a cold start is, is if a, good, a good analogy is a getaway driver in a bank robbery, right? If you're sitting in the car waiting for your mates to come out of the bank with all the bags of money, do you sit there with the engine running or the engine off? Right? Because if like, everyone get, uh, is everybody in? Has everybody got the seatbelt on? Okay, let, we'll get started then. You know, that's not the way you do it, right? You sit there revving, ready to go. And it's the same thing when you start, when you call a Lambda function, which isn't actually already running, because that Lambda function then needs to be retrieved from memory, it needs to be loaded up, it needs to be spun up. That takes time. Once it's running, then it can take new requests quickly. But that first phase, that cold starts phase, that actually takes time. And la cold starts with Java were five to 10 times longer. You know, there's a lack of JVM tuning options in uh, Lambda functions. I mean, you can set the memory, but that's about it. And the other reason I think that Java might be slow is the underlying implementations, because you are using, even though the, the, the functionality was exactly the same, the actual underlying implementations are different. Even the, the AWS SDK is different on Node.js than it is for Java. So there could be something in there that was causing problems as well. Another thing is this is a, you know, a good use case for Project Jigsaw, right? Uh, because if you're spinning, if you, if you reduce the size of your, of, 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 of your runtime, then you are going to get a quicker startup, a quicker cold start. So am I saying that Java shouldn't or that Java doesn't belong in AWS Lambda? No. No, of course Java has a place there. But you need to evaluate your use case. All of my experiences here are based on my use case. If your use case is slightly different, you might get completely different results. So you need to look at your use case. You need to look at your costs. You need to look at what, what do you want to do with these Lambda functions, you know? And um, are you a Java shop or are you a JavaScript shop? Do you have the tools and the competence needed to create Node.js Lambda functions? Or is it easier for you to do them in, in Java? You need to also mess around with different memory settings. I read a very interesting blog the other week about a guy. What he'd done, he'd, taken, um, he'd, he'd written a Lambda function in Python to, create, to calculate some kind of mathematical uh, equation. And he ran that Lambda function with the different memory settings. And what he found was with the, ma the highest memory setting, it actually cost him less money to run the Lambda function than it did with the lowest memory setting because it ran so much faster. So you need to kind of like, you know, try different memory settings, play around. Don't just assume that you have to use the lowest memory setting to save money. Another thing is to remember the free tier. You know, with Lambda functions, you get a heck of a lot of free stuff. And that, that free tier is always there. That will never go away. That doesn't go away after a year. Whether you've been using Lambda functions for one year or 10 years, you will still get the same amount of free seconds every month. So if your usage is below that threshold, it's not going to cost you any money. Right, I'm almost finished. Before I, am fi before I do finish, I just want to make sure that email didn't come through, just to, to prove that the dinosaur pictures didn't re respond in an email, just to, for fun, because the internet was running so slowly. There you go, I didn't get any more emails, so it did work with the filter. Right, back to my talk, and basically, I'm almost done now, so um, if you'd like to know more, I'm going to be putting the slides out on my uh, Twitter feed, after this talk, I've also created a GitHub with all of the source code for both the Java and the Node.js versions, including instructions for how you can replicate the camera. There's quite a few people who've done it, so it's a, it's a fun project and it shouldn't take you too long. So with that all done, it's time for lunch. Thanks for listening. <laughs> if anybody does have any questions, you're welcome to ask. Uh, oh, there's one. Yes, sir. Offline analyzers. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's a good good idea. I mean, like you could like theoretically have like I don't know a neural network, something like TensorFlow. Is that what you're thinking? Running, running on. Yeah. But the only th I know you can do that, and I've started reading some blogs where some people have done that with OpenCV and the Raspberry Pi. But you'd need I think you'd need to be using the Raspberry Pi three. I'm not sure the Pi Zero would would be able to handle it. But I have read about a uh, image. There's, there's a um, neural network called YOLO, uh, and that's, that's starting to show pretty good results with kind of offline image analysis. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Sorry? The night vision camera. No, I did. I did actually play around with it. If, if I go right to the, 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 one of the pictures when I did my uh, introduction of who I am, you can actually see that working. So what I did is I bought, uh, I bought the Noir, this one here. So I bought a Noir and I bought an infrared light source and I got that picture. Oh, where's it gone now? Yeah, I got that picture there, which you can't really make out so good on this screen, but you can make it out good on my, on my laptop. And it worked. But the thing is with the infrared light sources, they cost a fortune because the cheap ones are all spotlights. But if you have a garden, you need something that's going to kind of have a wider field of vision, right? Or a wider spread. And that, that costs a lot more. So I haven't really done, I haven't really got much further in the, infrared, in the night vision side of things. Any other questions? Yeah? You're the second person to ask me about that. No, I haven't. Not with these cameras, no. And I've, I've been running these cameras like nonstop for oh, a year and a half now, actually. And I've never had like a corrupted SD card on them. But I also have a Raspberry Pi 3 running a dashboard in my living room uh, with a dashboard which has like kind of today's calendar and the bus timetable and stuff like that. And that, that crashes like quite often. And I wonder if it's something to do with like... Uh, it could be the, the power adapter. If you get like mild fluctuations in the power, that maybe it kind of results in the corrupted SD card. I'm, I'm, that's the only thing I can think of that's a problem. Yeah, but I never do that. Yeah, but maybe, maybe it's a power cut in the house. That could be it as well. So that could be another reason. If you get like it, I always shut down these cameras manually. When I, when I disconnect them from power. That's a kind of like smart thing to do with the Raspberry Pi. It's not like an Arduino. It doesn't really, doesn't really like being, uh, having the, the power pulled out. Yeah. Any further questions? No, I think we're all done. Yeah, okay, enjoy your lunch then. Thanks very much.